Washington, September 11th, 1939. Private. My dear Churchill, it is because you and I occupied similar positions in the Great War that I want you to know how glad I am that you are back in the Admiralty. Your problems are, I realize, complicated by new factors, but the essential is not very different. What I want you and Prime Minister Chamberlain to know is that I shall at all times welcome it if you will keep me in touch with anything you want me to know about. You can always send sealed letters through your pouch or my pouch. Oh, I'm glad you did the Marlborough volumes before this thing started, and I much enjoyed reading them. With my sincere regards, faithfully yours, Franklin D. Roosevelt. London, October the 5th, 1939. The following from Naval Person. Your letter takes me back to 1914, and it is certainly a most unusual experience to occupy the same post fighting the same enemy 25 years later. I am sorry there has been trouble about recent incidents. Instructions have been given only to arrest and fire upon enemy ships out of sight of United States shores. I am happy to report that as a result of action off the River Plate, the whole South Atlantic is now clear of warlike operations. In case you may be interested in details of recent action, I am sending various reports by first airmail. The damage to HMS Exeter from 11-inch guns was most severe, and the ship must largely be rebuilt. The marvel is, she stood up so well. Permit me to send you, sir, all the compliments of the season. February 1st, 1940, Washington, D.C. My dear Churchill, ever so many thanks for that tremendously interesting account of the extraordinarily well-fought action of your three cruisers. I'm inclined to think that when we know more about the facts, it will turn out the damage to the pocket battleship Graf's Bay was greater than reported. I wish I could talk things out with you in person, but I am grateful to you for keeping me in touch as you do. Always sincerely, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Friday evening last, I received His Majesty's commission to form a new administration, and this I have done. I say to you tonight, as I said to the House, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. We have before us an ordeal of the most grievous kind. You ask, what is our policy? I can say, it is to wage war, by land, sea, and air, to wage war against a monstrous tyranny never surpassed in the lamentable catalogue of human crime. That is our policy. You ask what is our aim? It is victory. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. For without victory there is no survival. I take up my task with buoyancy and hope. I feel sure that our cause will not be suffered to fail among men. And so I say, come, let us go forward together with our united strength. I guess that speech rates my going against my military advisers and sending him the guns he needs. Sub-Lieutenant J.N. Carter, Mediterranean, March 17th, 1940. Dear all, still okay, and my goodness, we've had some excitement. One day, just as it was getting dark and difficult to see, 14 hindquarters soared down out of the sky right past the ship they're very fast and they got a hot reception. Everyone let up with everything they had at once, including one old fellow who rushed down and got a shotgun and fired wildly with it. That cleaned them off for 10 minutes or so, and then, when it was almost dark, they all came back. It was a wonderful exhibition. The whole sky was covered with tracer bullets and searchlights. I think that we got one of the planes because the searchlights just had it for a few seconds and then lost it as it was falling. The rest thought better of it and sped away as fast as possible with the searchlights following them. They did drop a few bombs, but I think they missed badly. We were just going to sit down for dinner and were most annoyed to find ourselves thwarted. On another less exciting subject, it is impossible to do anything and our books have nearly run out. We can't get more, so what I should like is the stamp collection. 
Will you send my album and any boxes of stamps that are lying around? The idea somehow seems to appeal to me, so also, I should very much like one of Stanley Gibbon's stamp catalogues. I expect you can get one second hand somewhere. Also, some boxes of stamp hinges. You can't get anything up here. I went for a paper chase the other day and thoroughly enjoyed it. I was one of the five home, and with half an hour start we were followed by about 40 hounds. We led them a great chase all over the hills and through rivers and mudflats. Altogether it was great fun, but I was very stiff the next morning. Heaps of love, John. London, May the 15th, 1940. Most secret and personal. President Roosevelt, from former naval person. My first letter to you as Prime Minister. Although I have changed my office, I am sure you would not wish me to discontinue our intimate, private correspondence. As you are no doubt aware, the scene has darkened swiftly. The enemy have a marked preponderance in the air, and their new technique of blitzkrieg is making a deep impression upon the French. I think myself, the battle on land has only just begun. Now to the present, Hitler is working with specialized units in tank and air. The small countries are simply smashed up, one by one, like matchwood. We must expect, though it is not yet certain, that Mussolini will hurry in to share the loot of civilization. We expect to be attacked here ourselves, both from the air and by parachute and airborne troops in the near future, and are getting ready for them. If necessary, we shall continue the war alone, and we are not afraid of that. But I trust you realize, Mr. President, that the voice and force of the United States may count for nothing if they are withheld for too long. You may have a completely subjugated, Nazified Europe, established with astonishing swiftness, and the weight may be more than we can bear. All I ask now is that you should help us with everything short of actually engaging armed forces. Immediate needs are, first of all, the loan of 50 of your old destroyers to bridge the gap between what we have now and the large new construction we put in hand at the beginning of the war. If Italy comes in against us with another hundred submarines, we may be strained to breaking point. Secondly, we want several hundred of the latest type of aircraft. And thirdly, anti-aircraft equipment and ammunition, of which we will have plenty next year, if we are alive to see it. We shall go on paying dollars for as long as we can, but I should like to feel reasonably sure that when we can pay no more, you will give us the stuff all the same. The visit of a United States squadron to Irish ports would be invaluable. I am looking to you to keep that Japanese dog quiet in the Pacific. With all good wishes and respect. From the President to former naval person, I have just received your message, and I am sure it is unnecessary for me to say that I am most happy to continue our private correspondence as we have in the past. I am, of course, giving every possible consideration to the suggestions made in your message. With regard to the final point, as you know, the American fleet is now concentrated in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, where it will remain, at least for the time being. The best of luck to you. London, from former naval person. Many thanks for your message, for which I am grateful. I do not need to tell you about the gravity of what has happened. We are determined to persevere to the very end, whatever the result of the great battle raging in France may be. We must expect, in any case, to be attacked here on the Dutch model before very long, and we hope to give a good account of ourselves. But if American assistance is to play any part, it must be available now. We are evacuating our troops from Dunkirk. <laughs> defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. <laughs>